All right, well, I just want to welcome everybody to this month's Wildlife Wednesday from the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. We are very excited that we have Miley Branson here with us today, and she is going to be talking to us about avian influenza in seabirds of Beringia. Next slide, Miley. But before we get into her presentation, uh, because we are using Zoom and we are virtual, just a couple of engagement guidelines. Uh, unfortunately, some of our colleagues have experienced Zoom bombing. And if you don't know what that is, you're very lucky. Um, but for those of you who do, because we are a family friendly event and we don't require registration, we do ask that you keep your microphone off and your video camera off during the presentation. This will also preserve bandwidth and uh, keep the screen from glitching up as much. And to make things a little bit easier for you to view, we encourage you to view uh, Miley's presentation today in the full screen mode. So look for that little picture frame symbol if you're not in that. And then to ask a question, we ask that you use the chat feature. And you can go ahead and type your question at any point in time that you have them during her presentation, but we will address the questions at the end. Okay. And then most importantly, you know, we hope that you have fun this evening and you learn something new from this. Next slide. And before we jump in, I just want to give a little bit about Alaska Wildlife Alliance or AWA. We have been advocating for Alaska's wildlife since 1978. We are an Alaska-based nonprofit protecting Alaska's wildlife through citizen mobilization, advocacy, and education. And so we are a local-based nonprofit and we do work off of donations and grants. Um, so if you want to become a member, you can become a member for as little as $35 a year by going to our website at akwildlife.org, or you can support us in some other ways. Uh, for instance, we are a charity on Amazon Smile, and if you're not familiar with that, uh, instead of going to amazon.com, you can just go to smile.amazon.com, and you can select AWA or Alaska Wildlife Alliance as the organization you want to benefit and they will give us a half a percent of your purchase price uh, at no additional cost to you. So if you do Amazon shopping like I do, it's a really easy way to support uh, a good cause and good charities. Uh, we also participate in the Roundup app. That is where if you make a purchase, um, Roundup will actually round your change up to the nearest dollar and donate that change to us. We're really appreciative of that. We are also part of the PFD Pick, Click, Give program. So I know for this year, the program has ended, um, but keep us in mind for future years. And if you are a federal employee, we are a new participant to the combined federal campaign. So you could donate directly that way too. Next slide, please. Uh, we we'll also wanna encourage you to follow us on Facebook um, and other social media like Instagram. Uh, if you're not, just to give you an idea of some of the things that you're missing, is we use those platforms to give you information about wildlife advocacy and uh, opportunities where you can go ahead and uh, put forth public comments on management decisions and be part of the rulemaking process. We also highlight wildlife education and events, such as Miley's Wildlife Wednesday talk tonight. And then we like to have a little bit of fun and just share unique or fun, silly things. Like uh, in case you hadn't seen, there was a rare white orca spotted near Southeast Alaska recently. So check us out on Facebook. Next slide. And then speaking of advocacy, I just wanna give you guys a rundown. We had a very busy month last month in August. Uh, we wanna thank everybody, first of all, who submitted comments and who provided a voice for wildlife regarding the proposed rule to change wildlife management practices on the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. So that public comment period recently closed and I wanna let you know there were over 31,000 comments on that. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we also were, um, filed several lawsuits last month. And so one of them, and all of these relate to um, some egregious activities that would have negative effects to Alaska's wildlife. So the first one is that we sued the Department of Interior and the National Park Service for adopting a rule that would allow extreme sport hunting practices like bear baiting and killing wolves and their pups during the denning season in Alaska's national preserves. These include iconic public lands such as Denali and Wrangell St. Elias. Next slide, please. Another suit was that we took on the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Land Management 
we took them to court for their illegal plan to open the coastal plains of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil companies. Stopping these lease sales is essential pr to protecting Arctic wildlife already stressed by climate change. Next slide, please. And then finally, we've filed a lawsuit challenging decisions by the Interior Department, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for approving a route through the Ambler Road, or for the Ambler Road. The road would expose critical watersheds to pollution. It would fragment caribou herd migrations, threaten critical bird habitat, and put stress on moose populations along the Koyukuk, Kobuk, Wild, Alatna and John Rivers. And so all of these, we actually were uh, filed thanks to Trustees of Alaska and other organizations. So this is definitely a coalition of groups trying to stand up for wildlife in Alaska. Next slide. So onto something more fun, and this is brand new news as of yesterday. Our Cook and the Beluga whales have been sighted back in the Kenai River on September 1st. And in case you didn't know, um, Alaska Wildlife Alliance is part of the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, which is AKBMP or ACBM. Um, and it's a citizen science program to collect data about our Cook Inlet Beluga whales. And there's several stations all along Cook Inlet. And Alaska Wildlife Alliance, we coordinate the monitoring sessions at the Kenai and Kisilaf rivers. So we're very excited that we got our first report of belugas back in the Kenai River yesterday. Our fall season is actually gonna run August 15th. So we've just been going for about two weeks through November 15th. And something that's brand new is if you would like to receive text alerts about when belugas are reported in the Kenai or Kisilaf rivers, we now have a system where you can text the word beluga to 833-541-0408 and you'll receive a daily alert on um, only if we do get a report of belugas. So um, if you're interested in that, I will put this information in the chat box so you can look at it a little bit later. And then if you wanna learn more about this citizen science program, you can, um, or about ACBUMP in general, you can go to akbmp.org, or if you wanna look at us through Facebook, just look for Alaska BMP. Next slide. And then something else we have fun uh, going on is we are now taking photos or um, soliciting photos for our annual wildlife photo calendar contest. And these are the photos that were the winners of our uh, 2020 calendar. And so if you're interested and you don't have to be a professional photographer, um, you don't have to actually be in the back country. Some of these photos were actually taken, you know, while on a wildlife cruise or um, at the Alaska Sea Life Center. So we just love fun photos of Alaska's wildlife. Um, and so all you have to do is just submit your photo to me, Mandy at akwildlife.org by the end of this month, so September 31st, uh, 30th, sorry, September 30th, and uh, include your name, where you took the photo, and a couple of sentences describing the picture. We like to tell the story. And then our winners will receive a free calendar and bragging rights. Sorry, we're a small nonprofit, so no monetary awards, but those bragging rights are pretty important. Um, and then you'll also notice we have a, a little pumpkin bear as one of our photos. So in October, we, have a, um, we highlight our members' pumpkin carving skills. And so this was our winning photo from, uh, for 2020. And so if you wanna participate in the wildlife themed pumpkin carving, and this one was a little extreme, previous years it's just been one pumpkin. So be creative, um, just send me those photos by uh, October 28th, so a couple days before Halloween, so we can you know, announce the winners. And again, that's to Mandy at akwildlife.org. All right, next slide, Miley. Uh, and just really quickly, we are, since we have gone virtual, we have been recording our presentations. So if you've missed one of our previous Wildlife Wednesdays, um, you can go and check them out online. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Beluga program, uh, you actually see we have a presentation of Belugas in our backyard. And it was talking about the AKBMP monitoring in the Kenai River last year. So you can learn a, bit, a little bit more. And also Teresa Becker, she is a new intern with Alaska Wildlife Alliance, and she is going to be our Kenai site monitor. So we're really excited to have her on board. Uh, next month, we're going to be uh, unraveling the mysteries of bats in Alaska. 
And then in November, we're going to learn about hormones and whales and what the tiny molecules can tell us about the giants of the sea. Next slide. But enough about that. Oops. Next slide. We'll skip that one. <laughs> we'll go at the end. Um, Oh, am I? I'm in the wrong place. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so while Miley goes and finds her uh, presentation, um, I just want to go ahead and uh, say thank you in advance to Miley. Uh, she is volunteering her time to do this presentation for us, and so we're very excited. And it looks like we're ready to go. So I'm going to turn it over to Miley, and she's going to teach us about the dynamics of avian influenza virus in Alaska. Take it away, Miley. All right, so hi everyone. I'm Miley. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Department of Biological Sciences um, with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I'm here today to talk to you about in avian influenza virus in the Bering Sea. Um, so before we start, maybe just a little bit about myself. Um, I live here. I live in Seward. Um, I completed my bachelor's degree at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, and then I went on to do a master's degree through the University of Florida in fish pathology. Um, and while I was there, I took a class on zoonotic disease, which I'll talk about with you guys in a second. Um, and it totally rocked my world. So when I, want, when I decided I wanted to go on and do a PhD, um, this is definitely what I was interested in doing. Um, so we can move on ahead into my presentation. Okay, so um, before we start, I'd like to just kind of introduce this concept of One Health with you guys. Um, I know it seems, it seems a little bit obvious, but in the science world, um, previously we had kind of a very singular way of approaching some of these problems, and the One Health initiative is, is kind of a new initiative um, that incorporates this idea of, of the interconnection between environmental health, human health, and animal health, and sort of um, the idea, it really reinforces the idea that all of these things are, are related um, and interconnected. Um, so I'd just like you guys to keep that in mind moving forward um, as we talk about some of this stuff, because it, it definitely pertains to some of this stuff. Um, so I'd also like to introduce this, this concept of a zoonotic disease. So what is a zoonotic disease? Um, so I pulled this picture from the CDC. This is their little graphic. Um, and it says zoonotic diseases spread between animals and people. Um, to the lay person, that's what a zoonotic disease is. But what a zoonotic disease really is, um, is it's a disease that's transmitted between species. So um, people are obviously um, a species of animal, if you really think about it. So it's really from species to species. Um, so actually, the majority of diseases that we encounter today are, um, are zoonotic in nature. So 75% of newer emerging infectious diseases in people come from animals, and um, about 60% of the known infectious <clears throat> sorry, diseases in people can be spread from animals. So if we kind of reach deep in our brains and think about the kinds of diseases um, that you typically see in animals. So I've got bats here. Obviously, we all know SARS-CoV-2, um, or as we know it, the coronavirus outbreak. That came from bats. Um, Ebola came from bats. Bats uh, carry rabies. Um, so bats are actually especially concerning when it comes to zoonotic disease. Um, <clears throat> birds, I'm about to talk to you about how birds carry flu. Um, swine also carry flu as well as a whole host of other diseases. Um, cats, if you've ever been pregnant, uh, lived with a pregnant person, you know that you're not supposed to clean the litter box when you're pregnant or interact with cat fecal matter in any way. This is because cats can carry, um, among other diseases, um, a disease called toxoplasmosis, um, which is a uh, protozoal parasite that, um, that can really do some damage to, to a fetus. Um, and then when you move on into livestock animals, there's a whole bunch of diseases that you can get from livestock animals. Um, brucellosis, tuberculosis, um, there's a whole bunch of them. So uh, these are just a few, just to give you an example and kind of put you in the zoonotic disease mind frame here. So let's talk a little bit about influenza. So what is influenza? So I feel like people throw 
throw this term around a lot, the flu. Um, you'll hear people be like, oh, it's a flu. Um, it's just the flu. Um, and I think what people really mean to say is influenza. So influenza virus. Um, influenza is a virus. It is not alive. Um, so viruses are not alive. They're, they are classified on the tree of life, but they are actually, um, they're again, not technically alive. They're obligate intracellular parasites. So what this means is that they need living cells to replicate. So they've got genetic material, um, but they don't have the machinery to survive by themselves. So they basically hijack a host cell um, and use this cell to replicate and they cannot live without it. So they are a cellular parasite. Um, there are four species, if you will, of flu. Um, so we have influenza A, um, and this infects humans and a lot of other different types of animals, and I'll go over that in a second. Um, influenzas B, C, and D infect mammals. Um, B and C infect humans. Um, B is kind of pathogenic, but C, influenza C doesn't really um, affect humans that much. And influenza D was just discovered uh, fairly recently and it is not known to infect humans, um, but there's not a whole lot that we know about it so far. So for the purposes of this talk, I will be talking about influenza A. So why should we care about influenza A? Um, so the CDC or the Center for Disease Control estimates, and they've got a little asterisk there, that's an estimate, um, that during last year's flu season, so they define that as between October 1st and February 29th, um, is kind of their typical definition of a flu season. So that's when flu cases peak in the US. Um, we experienced between 34 and 49 million illnesses, um, between 16 and 23 million medical visits, um, between 350 and 620,000 hospitalizations, and between 20 and 52,000 deaths. And this is kind of your typical flu season. Um, there are some that are worse and, and some that are a little bit more mild. Um, but again, I'll talk about why that is in, in just a moment here. Um, so as you can see, this is a, this is a big public health concern. Um, and it's also an economic concern. You know, this costs, this costs our healthcare system a lot of money um, in addition to just um, putting people at risk. Um, so influenza A is a zoonotic disease. Um, so it can infect quite a number of animals and there are actually quite a few different species that I didn't put on here. I just put on some of, some of your kind of regular animals. So um, birds are what we call the reservoir species for influenza. So they, um, they regularly have influenza and it's thought that, that all influenza A's originated from birds. So, um, we have what's called spillover events, and these are events in which um, a zoonotic disease jumps basically from the reservoir species to a new species. Um, so you can see here uh, influenza A has spilled over into seals, whales, horses, dogs, cats, and there's actually a whole bunch of other ones like I mentioned. Um, there's some random animals like ferrets, um, big cats, there's like lions and tigers and, and a bunch of a bunch of other kind of things like that. Um, I've also got bats down here in the corner. So bats carry um, a totally separate type of influenza A that is thought to have originally spilled over from birds, um, but it's pretty phylogenetically distant. So I've got I've got bats a little bit separate because their influenza A's um, don't don't regularly infect any other animals um, and, and there doesn't really appear to be a whole lot of transfer occurring there. Um, so in red I've got swine and humans and um, this kind of dynamic between birds, swine, and humans is, is the most important and I'll be talking about that a little bit more in the next slide but I just kind of wanted to introduce you to, to what influenza A looks like um, in the animal world. So in order to understand um, the influenza A virus, I need to kind of take you on a molecular tour of the virus structure. So um, it's gonna get a little bit, a little bit molecular heavy, but I think, I think it'll be okay. So just bear with me for the next couple of slides here. Um, so what we've got here, and I'll move this little picture of, of Mandy up here. Um, so what we've got here is a single influenza virus, or what we call a virion. 
Um, the genetic material pack packaged in the center of the virion um, comes in eight segments, and it's actually RNA. It's not DNA like we have. Um, and these eight segments are totally separate. So, so that kind of comes into play um, with the mutation of the influenza virus, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so you don't really need to know what any of these eight segments do, except for two of them. So the first segment is hemagglutinin, and it encodes for this surface protein that you see in the yellow here. Um, so th what the hemagglutinin does is it facilitates um, the, the virus docking and entering into the cells. So it kind of facilitates the, the um, pathogenicity and infectivity of the virus. Um, and the second one is nerminidase, and it's this second surface protein, it's this green one. Um, and what the nerminidase does is it facilitates the, the release of the new virions from the cell once they have replicated. So um, basically these two surface proteins are, um, don't solely control pathogenicity, but they play the largest role in, in how pathogenic an influenza virus is. Sorry, I'm going to have to move this again. No, it's not going. Um, okay, so I'm going to take you on a little tour of, of how influenza infects um, a host cell so you can get an understanding of how exactly this works. Um, so you have an influenza virion over here on the left. Um, it comes along and when it reaches the surface of the host cell, um, it docks and binds to this, this surface receptor. Um, so if we picture this little, little purple guy here on the cell surface, um, it's binding to that surface receptor and what it's doing is it's acting almost like a lock and key mechanism. So as soon as it binds, um, it induces what we call a conformational change, which basically is like fitting the key into the lock and like twisting the doorknob. So as soon as this hemagglutinin binds to that surface receptor, it unlocks the cell and the cell just sort of like sucks the virus in. Um, and this is called endocytosis. So the virus is taken in by the cell. Um, it is digested for, for lack of a, a better word. Um, and this, the uh, genetic material in the center of the RNA is released. So this RNA is taken into the nucleus of the host cell um, and it undergoes transcription, which is basically um, making copies, um, to put it simply, making copies of this RNA. Um, from transcription, um, this viral RNA moves out. Um, it's translated, so it moves into this, this, um, this component called the Golgi apparatus, and which contains these little things called ribosomes. And these little ribosomes basically are like little factories that, that read the RNA and then build the proteins based on according to the instructions. So they like read the instructions and make, make new virus parts. Um, so once these new virus parts are made, they are um, sort of exported out of the cell and they're assembled and they sort of bud from the surface of the cell. And what actually happens is as the virus is budding, the surface of the cell becomes the surface of the virus. So I don't know for those of you who are familiar with biology, the surface of a cell is a lipid bilayer. bilayer. So if you picture like, like a drop of oil, kind of like bubbling off a new drop of oil, that's basically exactly what's happening. Um, so as soon as the virus buds, you have a brand new fresh virion. Um, so this is just another depiction of how many different types of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are out there. So um, there are 18 different types of hemagglutinin and 11 different types of neuraminidase. And if you take those last two away, those are actually not relevant because they, they belong with bats only. So it's really 16 and nine. Um, and these are kind of how we classify the flu. Um, sorry, I tried to make this a little bit bigger. I know it's kind of tiny, um, but so basically all of these components, and I'm gonna talk about this in a second, can, can recombine and you can have um, any number of combinations between these. Um, and you can see they, this is directly from the CDC, this figure, um, and it lists which animals um, certain subtypes prefer. 
So what can also happen is um, this, this phenomenon, it's called antigenic shift, um, if you're fancy or viral reassortment. Um, so what happens is when you have a co-infection, um, so let's pretend we have H2 and 7. So if we call this little orange guy H and this little teal colored guy um, or H2 and this little teal, teal colored one is N7. Um, and let's call this, this little green knob H5 and then this little gray one um, N1. So what happens is when you have a co-infection of these two um, viruses, the viruses break apart, the genetic material is imported into the nucleus, and because it is in segments, um, these segments can recombine. So when you have new viruses being made, not only can you have the two, um, the two original virions, um, but you can have entirely new viruses. So in addition to H2N7 and H5N1, you could potentially have H2N1 or H5N7. So you can kind of start to see how, um, how this kind of creates that mixing of influenza subtypes. Um, and just a little reminder, sorry, I keep having to, uh, to move this little guy out of the way. Um, so just a word about nomenclature here. Um, when I say subtype, this is typically how we, we kind of generally refer to different kinds of flu. So when I say subtype, this is where um, this is where you hear you know people will say like oh H one N one or whatever. So what they're talking about is they're typing the influenza virus based on its pathogenicity um, and according to the hemagglutinins and the neuraminidases that it's expressing on the surface. Um, and when we say strain, we are talking a bit about a very specific. Um, individual strain of influenza isolated. And I probably, I won't use the term strain a lot here, um, uh, but when you look at strains, like when you go to get the flu vaccine, so they'll vaccinate you against specific strains. Um, and because these strains are changing every year um, due to the antigenic shift that I, that I just um, showed you guys, um, when you go to get the flu vaccine every year, this is why you have to get it every year. Um, you'll see, you'll either get a, a, a trivalent or a quadrivalent vaccine, most likely. Um, and so that means it either contains uh, three different vaccinations against three different strains or four. Um, and so when you go to get it, you can open up your pamphlet um, and take a look and it will list the, the specific strains that you've been vaccinated against. Um, and it'll have something just like this. So just like this, uh, influenza A, uh, it was isolated from a turkey in Scotland. This is just a unique identifier number. Um, and then they put the, the year and the subtype. Um, so like I mentioned before, this is um, influenza A is regularly circulating in birds. It's kind of a natural component. Um, and it circulates between both migratory and um, endemic species of bird. Um, so what we have here, so I've kind of, I've kind of brought that anti antigenic shift out, um, just taken a step back to the organism level, um, just so you can see what this looks like in a population of birds. So let's pretend you have um, a small migratory bird that's kind of come through. Um, and you have an endemic species of, let's say, the seabird. Um, and let's pretend that these birds all have H1N1, like the one in the center. Um, and this migratory bird comes along and introduces H5N7. Um, and all of a sudden, not only can you have um, H1N1 being produced from this co-infection um, and H5N7, but you can have any combination of those. So you can have, again, H5N1, H5N7, H1N1, or H1N7. So when you start to look at this from a global scale, um, you start to realize that this is kind of just like a huge global mixing pot of flu in birds. Um, so this figure is basically showing, so every, every blue arrow in this figure is the migratory path of a specific species of bird. Um, and all of these birds are coming to Alaska. And this is what makes Alaska and the Arctic so important is because um, 
it's a breeding ground for so many migratory birds. And so we have these birds coming from literally every continent. And every year they're bringing a new strain of flu or a new subtype of flu. Um, and they're all mixing together and then they're all bringing it home. And this is kind of thought to, to be what um, in, in part drives a lot of the, the seasonal dynamics of influenza um, is this kind of like giant global mixing. Um, and so when these birds come back home, um, they can potentially deposit these, these novel subtypes and strains of flu um, and precipitate what we call epizootics. So an epizootic is, is basically the animal version of an epidemic. Um, so you can see this both in agricultural animals. So um, they, wild birds can, can deposit um, novel influenzas um, in agricultural settings like pig farms or chicken farms. Um, or they can deposit them in wildlife settings and, and cause um, real harm to endemic species of wildlife. And um, so we would call these um, not necessarily unusual mortality events, but um, these are definitely mortality events that we, we investigate keeping these sorts of things in mind. So um, I know we had, um, we had a couple of seabird die-offs recently and a lot of those birds were tested. Um, it didn't come up, in fact, that, that many of them had, were carrying influenza, so um, it's, it's likely thought that those were caused by starvation. Um, but we also had an unusual mortality event on the East Coast um, of seals, and a couple of those seals did test positive for influenza. So I believe the jury's kind of still out as to, as to whether that played any role in that sort of unusual mortality event. So these are kinds of things that we keep in mind when we look at um, how flu is moving around the world um, and, and what that looks like as far as both our wildlife and our agricultural animals. Um, and also if, if agricultural animals become infected, um, sometimes as a precautionary measure, um, people will call them. So for those of you who don't know what calling is, it's, it's a um, systematic slaughter of these animals in order to mitigate disease spread. Um, so oftentimes what will happen is, is if um, certain agricultural um, locations come up that they're having, they're having some issues with influenza, they'll just call the, the entire herd, the entire flock um, to prevent it from sp spreading. So I know a couple years ago, um, they had a poultry situation like that, and the world was kind of temporarily out of turkey and chicken for a little while. Um, but this actually happens kind of regularly in agricultural scenarios. So um, there are a couple of different spillover events that are particularly concerning um, for us. So there are basically three major routes of transmission here. So we have the direct wildlife transmission. So um, this would be like your hunting situation. If you go out hunting and you're handling a bird and you're touching bird blood and fecal matter and you bring it home or you touch your face or you put your finger in your eye, um, you can easily give the flu to yourself. Um, although this, this kind of direct spillover from wildlife is not super common, um, it does happen. So it's something to be aware of. Um, the other one that we look for again is um, wild birds transmitting to, um, to domestic or agricultural birds, um, which in turn um, interact quite a bit with humans. So in that case, we, we see spillover events happening there too. Um, but the transmission route that we're most concerned about is wild birds, um, spillover events between wild birds and swine. So swine are kind of unique because they contain receptors that bind to a lot of influenzas that are both mammalian and avian in nature. So swine are kind of like a really unique mixing vessel um, in which they can pick up both bird flus and mammal flus um, and, and mix those and potentially precipitate novel subtypes. Um, so, so this is kind of the transmission route that, that is um, most concerning when you're talking about public health and animal interaction. And then of course I have this little arrow down at the bottom where people are just giving it to each other. So this is why the CDC puts out um, these sorts of uh, educational pamphlets about interacting with uh, poultry. 
So we've got here this guy, he's coming in direct contact with the bird, he's touching the bird, and then he's touching his uh, eyes, nose, and mouth. Um, influenza is typically enteric, uh, it's in the, in the GI tract of birds. Um, it can be respiratory, but it's more likely that it's enteric. Um, so of course, surfaces, if you picture a chicken coop, you know, the birds are pooping everywhere. Um, and if they are carrying flu, guaranteed that the virus is all over that place. Um, so um, you can have both direct contact, contaminated surfaces, and then also just um, airborne droplets and dust. So the birds are moving, they're scratching, they're flapping their wings, they're shaking their heads, and um, virions are like in the bird's um, body and they're just kind of like flying off of the bird and you can inhale those and become sick as well. So same for pigs. Um, we've got this guy at the top. He touched a pig. He's got virus on his hands um, and then he's touching his face um, and then I think he's getting sweaty because he doesn't feel good. <laughs> um, and vice versa, and you can actually infect a pig. So they've seen this happen quite a bit as well, um, where people at petting zoos and things like that have actually given flu to pigs and kind of precipitated epizootics um, backwards, I guess, if you will. Um, and then we've got this scenario number two, where an infected pig is touching an inanimate, inanimate object. Um, in the public health world, we call this a fomite. So if you think about um, in your life, like your phone would be like the ideal fomite because um, you carry it everywhere with you. You take it to the bathroom. It touches everything. You set it down in weird places. Um, and same thing, as soon as you touch that inanimate object, you're touching your face, um, you're touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, and you are potentially infecting yourself. And finally, again, um, pigs do cough and sneeze just like people. In fact, when they're sick, um, you, can, you can walk into a barn and hear pigs like coughing and sneezing like people at night. Um, so that's also another potential route of transmission. So again, just to reiterate why this is important, not only is wildlife surveillance um, important specifically just for the wildlife, um, but it's important to monitor flu season dynamics and what, what subtypes and strains of flu are out there um, so we can make adequate public health decisions. And um, we actually do use a lot of these data, um, not necessarily the bird data, but um, some of the mammalian um, influenza uh, surveillance data is, is actually used for vaccine formulation. So um, when the CDC kind of compiles all of these data, um, they're looking at what's out there in order to make the best decision about what flu vaccine they're going to make for next year. Um, and again, this is why you have to get a flu vaccine every year because the flu is changing every year. Um, and they're trying their best to predict it, but they're not always accurate. I know last year they didn't expect there to be um, so many influenza Bs, so they ended up having to add an influenza B. Um, so yeah, there are just kind of a lot of components that go into this, but wildlife surveillance definitely helps, helps not only for wildlife health, but um, for human health as well. So moving into my project, um, let's talk a little bit about what the flu looks like in the Bering Sea. So for my research, I wanted to look um, in the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so this is a huge refuge. Uh, I actually had no idea it was this big. It's, so it's managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it, it, um, it covers about 3.4 million acres, um, a ton of coastline. It's like half of the Aleutian chain. Um, it houses 40 million birds or an estimated 40 million birds and it's particularly important for influenza because it sits right at that interface between um, Eurasia and North America. So as birds are coming over from Asia um, and bringing Eurasian subtypes of flu, um, this is probably going to be the first location that you'll see it. And not only is it the first location, um, but there are just so many birds. Um, so you'll probably, you know, not only will you see it first, but it, it's likely that it could precipitate epizootics in these sort of isolated seabird colonies. Um, and so particularly I'm focused on the Pribilof Islands because to my knowledge, 
um, there has not been too much um, infectious disease work done out there as far as, as the birds go. So I really wanted to check out what it looks like there. Um, so just as a general kind of high level overview. So we are part of, of a network of um, different agencies and organizations that, that monitor flu. Um, both in Alaska and kind of everywhere. So I know there are some folks from Tufts University that do a lot of stuff in Prince William Sound. Um, there are also some folks from USGS that do some stuff in Western Alaska. Um, but as you can see here, so we all kind of contribute to this, this giant flu database, and this is a nationwide database for everyone who's doing flu research. Um, and you can see here all these little red bubbles indicate flu positives. Um, but what I noticed when I was kind of looking at this is there isn't a whole lot of coverage in the Aleutian chain and there's nothing on the Pribilof Islands. So I specifically wanted to look here and, and see what was going on. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like out here, um, especially from a disease perspective. So you have these seabird colonies and as you can see, there are a ton of birds and they're nesting in very close quarters. Um, there's a lot of interspecific interactions, so you have a lot of different species interacting. Um, and as you can see, there is an awful lot of fecal matter going on, and this is kind of like the primary route of transmission. So um, I guess this is, yeah, this is like your prime uh, flu transmission scenario here. So again, this is important for subsistence users. Um, we've got a lot of people who um, harvest eggs, um, who hunt out there. Um, apparently there's actually quite a big um, sea duck hunting um, industry out in the Pribilof. So this is actually a pretty common practice um, in addition to the kind of subsistence type of use that we regularly see. Um, so not only are we concerned for the people out there, um, we wanted to look at what this looks like for the marine mammals out there. So there have been a few marine mammals um, in the Arctic and subarctic that have come up flu positive. Um, and I also want to look and see if, if there's any relation, if we're seeing similar subtypes, could this be um, the sort of uh, zoonotic spillover kind of interface that we're looking at. So like situations like this, where you have birds and seals or birds and whales interacting in close quarters, is this where the spillover is occurring? So again, my research questions, um, what subtypes are migratory birds bringing from Eurasia to Alaska? Um, what subtypes do resident seabird species carry? Um, and how much do these change from year to year? So is the flu pretty stable out there or um, is it just that, that foreign birds stop in and deposit novel influenzas and kind of um, wreak havoc on the local seabird colonies? So how do I do this? Um, I'm gonna try my best to give you kind of like a high level run through of how exactly this works. Um, so sample collection. So we do collect these birds, these uh, seabirds lethally, and they're part of a bigger project that encompasses a number of different analyses. So no part of these birds go to waste. I think they're part of at least five different studies that I can think of. Um, and they're sampled for all kinds of stuff. So my virology work is just a small part of what happens to these birds. And um, they do end up getting stored at the university for future use and future projects as well. Um, so these birds are sampled. Um, they're sampled at sea. We, we go out in a research vessel um, and we freeze them immediately and bring them back to the university where um, I conduct necropsies on them. So what this basically is, is it's the animal version of an autopsy. So um, I cut them up and I sample various tissues and I bring these tissues back to the virology lab. Um, where I'll extract all of the RNA or the genetic material. And I specifically target viral RNA, um, but I can extract total RNA as well. Um, so basically the way this works is I introduce some stuff that kind of like breaks apart the cells and breaks apart the viruses and gets the genetic material out there. Um, so then I run it through uh, what's called a PCR. And I'm not even gonna attempt to explain a PCR to you, but basically all you need to know is that the probe-based PCR just tells me, is flu there? 
Um, and then if I do detect flu, I run it through a multi-segment PCR. And basically this amplifies all eight of those little segments, those genetic segments that I showed you earlier. Um, and finally, I um, sequence this flu. So we actually use this technology, it's called nanopore technology, and um, they produce this really cool little mini sequencer. It's about the size of a flash drive. It's literally like this big. Um, and you can just plug into your computer. It's totally portable. Um, and you can have RNA sequenced within a day. Um, so we conduct this, this sequencing. And then from there, I can use that to do what's called bioinformatic analysis, which is basically like a computational genetics, I guess, um, where I can look at what, what types of flu it is. I can build phylogenetic trees. Um, I can do all kinds of stuff. So let's look at what we collected. So we collected between 2018 and 2019. Um, we took 146 birds and that encompassed 17 different species of birds. So we, we took 65 birds in 2018 and 81 in 2019. And this is the research vessel um, that we go out on. It's called the Tecla. It's run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it pretty regularly does these sort of research cruises up and down the Aleutian chain. And once we get back to the lab, so this is what the necropsy procedure looks like. So um, we take a number of different metrics on the birds before we even cut into them. And then, like I mentioned before, these tissues are sampled every kind of way. Um, no bit of the bird goes to waste. Um, we take everything. Um, and something really cool that I just wanted to show you guys is this picture on the left hand side. So this is, um, this is called a bursa. And so this is the cloaca of the bird. And for those of you that are not familiar, the cloaca is basically um, what we nicely call the urogenital um, tract. So it's basically the only exit tube from the bird. Um, and it's got this structure on it called the bursa. And it's like this paired horned structure. Um, and what the bursa actually does is it has an immune function. So the size of the bursa um, kind of relates to the immunocompetency of the bird, um, as well as the bird's age. So it's a really interesting organ and not too much is known about it. So we did collect those as well, but I haven't actually done anything with them. I just think that they're really cool. Um, so then we take it back to the virology lab and <laughs> These are just sort of like some random pictures of us doing things and stuff. Um, so on, on the, uh, the right hand side is, is me just uh, looking, I'm running a gel to visualize the, uh, the genetic components of the virus. And then on the left hand side is my advisor and he is actually loading the flow cell of that sequencer that I was talking about. So all it is, is you just plug it into that laptop um, we load the genetic material into there, and then we basically just push start and run the sequencer. I'm really simplifying it, but, but that's basically how it works. All right, so let's look at what I found. Um, so I did find actually quite a bit of flu. Initially, I found 29 positives out of the 146. Um, I was only able to successfully sequence uh, 24 of them. Um, some of them were really weak positives, so they were really hard to, to get enough genetic material out of them to sequence. Um, but as you can see here, I found flu in black guillemots, um, common mers, crested auklets, northern fulmars, parakeet auklets, pelagic cormorants, um, pigeon guillemots, redneck phalaropes, and thick-billed mers. Um, and as you can see, I saw kind of high occurrences in northern fulmars, thick-billed mers and common mers, especially northern fulmars. So um, I'm gonna get into that in just a minute. And when you look at subtypes, this is basically what I found. So I was only able to successfully sequence one virus from 2019, and I actually did not have a whole lot of positives in 2019. Um, so we are seeing a little bit of variation um, in, in seasonality of the virus. Um, but what I found as far as subtype diversity was um, it, it's actually pretty limited out there. So um, I found a lot of H1N2s 
-hmm. and um, a lot of H7N2s. And then I found a few birds that I believe had co-infections of both um, because I was having equal numbers of reads for both H1 and H7 and N1 and N2. So I believe that some of these birds actually had both. So I wanted to take it one step further and look at specifically the fulmars um, and look at what kind, of, what kind of diseases they were carrying. So I took the total RNA in the lung tissues of northern fulmars um, and I chose these because they seem to have sort of an equal distribution of flu positives and negatives so I could kind of compare between the two. Um, and I wanted to look at not only what diseases they were carrying, but what does the respiratory microbiome of a northern fulmar look like? So I know this figure is kind of crazy and it's probably gonna take a second to look at, um, but I found some really interesting things. Um, I found quite a bit of bacteria that I am not sure if they are part of the normal respiratory microbiome or if they are infectious within these birds. Um, so I found of particular interest, E. coli. So I've got that. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but it's here. Um, e. coli can be a respiratory disease in, um, in avian species. So that was of particular interest. Um, and then when I get down into the eukaryote, so I, I basically took these three different um, major clades. Uh, so I took bacteria, eukaryotes, which is basically like living organisms, like, um, I'm trying to think of what, what counts as a eukaryote, if I, if I could explain it to you. Um, but anyway, eukaryotes um, and viruses. So um, I found, of course, influenza virus, and this is verified by my influenza-specific testing. Um, but then within the eukaryotes, I found two really interesting protozoal um, organisms. So I found Plasmodium vivax, and for those of you that don't know, that's malaria. Um, that's, the, uh, that's, that's what causes malaria. And then I also found, it, found toxoplasma, so that causes toxoplasmosis. Um, so these are two really interesting organisms that I am not sure um, what they're doing there. Um, and I think I'm going to have to conduct further analysis. So this is kind of like an initial high level overview, but um, further analysis is definitely um, much needed on this. So um, more results, TBD. So what does all this mean? Um, so it means that seabird colonies are reservoirs for the flu, although um, there are seasonal changes in frequency, but there aren't really that many, uh, that much um, differentiation in subtype from year to year. So that's, I suppose, when you really think about it, that's probably good news um, because that means that there's not a whole lot of introduction of novel subtypes from Asia. Um, and whatever birds are stopping over are um, either just not interacting with those resident seabirds um, or maybe not carrying flu at all. Um, and finally, so I, I found those additional pathogens and I don't really know what they mean, um, but I think they also have possible zoonotic um, transmission implications to marine mammals. So a lot of those pathogens can jump to marine mammals as well. Um, so I definitely think that that warrants a little bit, uh, a little bit of closer examination. So just to kind of wrap this up um, and, and kind of bring it back to the bigger picture, We've been seeing a statistically significant increase in infectious disease emergence over time. Um, someone published a paper pretty recently that evaluated kind of all of these component, components and found that in fact, yeah, the level of, of emerging infectious diseases is, is climbing pretty rapidly. Um, and there are a couple of major components that, that contribute to this. So the first and foremost is human expansion into wildlife habitats. Um, so not only is this causing climate change, um, but it's also causing changes in animal migration and distribution patterns. Um, and this is kind of cyclical. If you kind of look at the arrows here, um, the climate change is further driving this, this um, change in animal distribution patterns. Um, but also as we're moving into these wildlife um, habitats, so as we're increasing agriculture, um, we're increasing deforestation, 
we're moving into their house and we're also kicking them out. So they have nowhere to go but to move right in with us. Um, so if you kind of think about it this way, it's really increasing our level of interaction with wildlife species. Um, and I think that this will this will continue to happen um, as we continue to, to move into their habitat and the climate continues to change. We also have things like like mosquitoes, um, and you also have a, a whole host of vector-borne diseases like that. Um, Tick-borne diseases, we're seeing ticks now in Alaska when we've never seen them um, in, in any frequency before. So um, a lot of things like that to just kind of keep in mind. And if we look at this kind of from, from a One Health perspective, um, these things are all sort of interrelated. So what can you do? Um, just be aware. So when you're recreating outdoors, just be aware that animals, animals can carry diseases. Um, ADF and G puts out a lot of really cool pamphlets about all the things that you could potentially get from handling raw meat, um, whether it be mammals or birds. Um, and when you're interacting with animals in your home, I know you love your pets, but um, they're also animals. So things like your cats and your chickens. Um, Dogs, not so much. Dogs can carry stuff, but I wouldn't worry as much about dogs as I would about sort of your, your typical livestock animals. Um, and as far as public health measures, just wash your hands, don't touch your face, um, get vaccinated. And if there are emergency public health measures issued, um, listen to them, please. <laughs> so I'd kind of just like to close with, with this um, this reminder again that um, we're all interrelated and um, One Health is a really important concept. What we do to the environment will kind of come back and, and affect us. Um, it affects the animals. Um, and so, yeah, I would just like when next time you encounter something, just think about it in this One Health context. And don't let your kids do this. <laughs> Um, any questions? Uh, thank you, Miley. I think that was really great. I just want to remind folks, uh, use the chat function to go ahead and post your questions. And if you want to temporarily turn off your, or turn on your camera so we can all give, you know, Miley a little quick um, round of applause, that is fine. Um, and while we're waiting for folks to go ahead and type their uh, chat questions, I just want to take this time to say thank you, Miley. Uh, we are very appreciative of the time that you put into this. We're appreciative of the research that you're doing and, and sharing this information with us. Um, we're also very appreciative to everybody who joined us tonight or who has joined us on previous Wildlife Wednesday presentations. Um, it's your interest that allows us to keep doing these programming. And um, just everybody who cares about wildlife, you know, it's really important right now. Things are definitely really trying times. And um, so just thank you for um, all your support uh, to our members and supporters as well. So thank you. And um, I'll go ahead and while folks are typing, I'll, I'll, I've got some questions, Miley, that um, I think, you know, the first half of your presentation really took me back to molecular biology class. <laughs> and um, so it's really exciting to see, you know, that the kind of things that I learned about and kind of forgot, they're really in the forefront right now, given all the issues that we've got going on globally. And it's really great to see that there's folks, you know, uh, actively working on the wildlife human connection. And then, you know, like taking the one health, the all inclusive approach. So thank you um, for that. Um, a question I had, though, was you were mentioning you saw some novel pathogens that you weren't expecting. And I was wondering, are you working with some of the states or uh, the in-state uh, veterinary pathologists? Um, I'm thinking we had a Wildlife Wednesday presentation a few months ago from Dr. Kathy Burek, and she was talking about wildlife diseases that she'd found. And I think she mentioned toxoplasmosis, but um, I don't remember her mentioning, you know, findings of malaria. And so I was just wondering what type of information sharing is going on. And um, um, So I actually just got those results like a couple days ago. Um, <laughs> that was going to kind of be my next step was to go around and kind of pick some brains because um, basically the way that that software works is it, it pulls from the, um, the NCBI um, database of genomes. And so um, 
it makes its most accurate guess. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back and, and both kind of molecularly look at it um, and just kind of make sure that that's, you know, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a close relative. Um, it, is, it is very accurate down to the genus level. Um, so it's for sure there. But um, yeah, I just, and, and then I also was going to go around and pick some brains because I, I, I am also just kind of baffled, especially the malaria one. I was like, what? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to have to pick a few brains before I, I move on with that one for sure. Oh, that was definitely interesting. And, you know, absolutely understand you want to do your due diligence on science. So um, it, definitely uh, look forward to seeing, you know, kind of what you learn and things like that. So thanks. Um, okay, so we got uh, some comments, uh, questions coming in. And so uh, one is saying, thanks so much for such a great presentation. And I concur. Um, Ed majored in molecular biology and he says your presentation was wonderful. Uh, and that he now finally understands the flu vaccine. So I guess it wasn't a question so much as a compliment uh, from Ed. Um, and then we have another one. It says, it seems like migratory species may be more important in terms of spreading influenza. Are Northern Fulmars the poster child for flu? Um, no, not really. <laughs> um, so waterfowl are, are the real culprits here. So, um, you see most of it in, in species like um, geese and ducks and things like that is where you really, um, you really start to see a lot of that flu transmission um, occurring. And a lot of that kind of like really dynamic like change between the seasons um, and stuff like that. I, I just wanted to look at kind of like a novel population and kind of an understudied region. And that's, that's where I was going with that. Um, but yeah, as far as like, if you really wanted to look for flu and find it, like 100%, you could go downtown in the fall with your little swab and pick up a bunch of like goose turds and like, uh, yeah, you would, you would for sure find a lot more flu that way. Um, I, I just decided to do it the hard way. Unfortunately. <laughs> That sounds, uh, that sounds good. I don't know that going down and just randomly picking up goose poo is on my uh, bucket list, but <laughs> if I was looking for flu, maybe. So, so. Um, okay, so another question is in regards to when there is co-infection of several viral types and the, uh, you were talking about, and this is my question, which is why I'm kind of stalling, um, talking about the, um, how, a cell gets infected and then it creates new viral subtypes based upon kind of the combination patterns. So I'm curious, how does mutation work into that? And, you know, because we hear about, you know, things getting mutated all the time and creating new strains that way. I'm just kind of curious, is that um, kind of the new viral subtypes related to mutation or is that an entirely separate process? And so we could actually, in your scenario, you had two coming in and four coming out. Could it be a lot more new types coming out? Um, so there isn't actually, there isn't a whole lot of mutation because those genomic regions are so, um, they're short and they're kind of like concise, if you will. Like they're, they code for exactly that one thing. There's a little bit of variation. Um, so yeah, it's actually twofold. So not only do you have that reassortment, but there is mutation also. There's just not, um, there's not much. And some segments mutate more than others. Um, so yeah, so eventually I will build a, a full phylogenetic tree. And this is kind of like the headache part where you have to computationally um, go in um, and build this, this phylogenetic tree based on the closest related for each segment. So that's kind of like my huge next step. But yes, so short answer, yes. Um, but not a lot. Okay, that's a good way. Uh, so another question is, um, can you help explain why people think coronavirus is related to influenza? Oh, this is an interesting question. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can explain that. I would say that um, probably because it presents as your classic viral illness, 
Um, so when people say like, it's a flu, um, that's kind of where I was getting at when people are like, it's just a flu. Um, it is not the flu. It's a totally different thing. Um, but I think because outwardly when you're sick with coronavirus, it's, it's a very similar classic presentation. Um, you know, you felt like chills, fever, um, kind of general like malaise and fatigue. I think that all of those are like what you would like the lay person would be like, I have the flu. Um, yeah, maybe that answers the question. <laughs> Do you know, um, I know there's kind of this talk about potential and this may be beyond your expertise, um, but there's this talk about this concern of, you know, the coronavirus numbers are gonna spike as we get into flu season. Yes. So is, is there, I guess, you know, it sounds like there might be a co-infection in that regard. Right. So that's, that's more an, an immunology thing. So, so what's actually happening is, um, is um, they're actually recommending that you get the flu vaccine, especially this season, because um, then your immune system is not going to be um, kind of like dampened by the flu. Like if you get the flu and then you get coronavirus, then you're in trouble. But um, yeah, so they, they're recommending that especially this year, if you're not typically a flu vaccine person, um, you're going to want to protect yourself just to kind of boost your immune system because, yeah, it's that co-infection that all of a sudden you're like double hit. Um, and if you're kind of down from the flu, then if you get coronavirus, um, that could potentially be super bad. Right. It makes sense. A lot of the protection methods um, will be helpful for both that are recommending. Yeah. So. Uh, we have one more question, and it's regard to the reference of that there were some of these uh, large number of die-offs, and um, you had mentioned not necessarily an unusual mortality events, but have you seen that there are some existing unusual mortality events in some ice seals and gray whales in Alaska? Has there been any testing to see if those animals have tested positive for influenza A? Yes, um, I believe that quite a few not quite a few. There, there has been some ice seal testing. Um, I'm not sure if they're the ones in the mortality events, um, uh, but I know there, there are not a significant portion, but there are some ice, ice seals that are coming up flu positive and they're actively mm -hmm. testing those. Um, as far as the gray whales, we actually had someone in our lab. Um, she just finished her master's and left um, to pursue a PhD, but she was looking at the gray whales as well. And I don't believe that she found any flu in those. Um, so I don't, I don't think that um, flu is, is a component of the gray whale, you and me, unfortunately. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions come up. So uh, I just wanted to take this time again to say thank you. We really appreciate your time. I want to thank everybody else uh, for sticking with us. I know we're a little past eight. Um, and we will go ahead and post this recording. Hopefully uh, next week, my uh, primary webmaster is uh, out in the back country having a good time and disconnected from technology. So when she gets back, we'll go ahead and get this recording posted. So uh, you can watch it again if you've got some more questions come up and you want to check something else again, or you know some other folks that would be really interested in this topic. Um, like I said, it was very pertinent to what we're all going through right now and kind of help explain some of this uh, and the transmission. So really, really appreciate it. Yep. And if anyone else has any other questions, um, you can definitely feel free to email me um, or look me up. I'm, I'm happy to reach out and, and answer whatever um, questions people might have. So, yeah. Hey. Well, thank you, Marley, and thanks to all of our participants today, and um, hopefully we'll see you at our Wildlife Wednesday next month. Yeah. Have a good evening. Thank you.